Let's start with Jenna. Hello, I'm Christina Davis, Director of the Program on U.S. Japan Relations. I'm very glad to welcome you here for a seminar by the title, Navigating Japan's Cybersecurity Environment, Dealing with External Threats and Internal Constraints. This is one of the most important topics to think about, and we're especially concerned with these issues as this week we've been reading about the leak of critical intelligence from the United States military. We witnessed its rapid spread across Discord, Twitter, other internet sites, showing how quickly critical security documents could become public knowledge, revealing information that is disturbing, both about how extensive the US uh, military uh, surveillance is and the dangers that are confronted, because we now have heard of Russian hackers targeting Canadian gas pipelines, we know there are a few limits to the vulnerabilities. So for you and I, this might mean we check our passwords. But for a government or a company, this kind of a threat requires a comprehensive full entity rethinking of what is security, how to guard against the many entry points that could release secret information, whether it is commercial espionage or spyware that could leak military secrets. Cybersecurity is emerging as one of the most significant policy challenges and opportunities in the US-Japan relationship. In 2014-15, the Japanese government established the Cybersecurity Strategic Headquarters in the Cabinet Office and the National Center for Incident Readiness and Strategy for Cybersecurity, serving as the Secretariat for this office. Just last December, the Japanese government approved a cabinet decision on the national security strategy in which information warfare and cyber defense are prominently featured as a central component in Japan's national security strategy. There are plans for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to use artificial intelligence to monitor cyberspace. The Ministry of Defense is working to train cyber warriors. Across all of these dimensions, we see the Japanese government and close coordination with the United States government taking new steps to secure its government operations from threats and to use it proactively to advance Japanese interests. To discuss Japan's cybersecurity strategies, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Nori Katagiri, who is the Associate Professor of Political Science at St. Louis University. He's the author, author of the 2015 book, Adapting to Win, How Insurgent Forces Fight and Defeat Foreign States in War. Professor Katagiri has published widely on cybersecurity, emerging technologies, and Japanese security policy. He previously taught at the Air War College and won several distinguished awards, including the Meritorious Civilian Service Award from the Department of Air Force and the Faculty Award for Research Excellence. He is one of those scholars who is able to bridge critical policy questions and academic research. And this is especially important in a new and evolving area such as cybersecurity. We are really fortunate to have you here to join us. We have asked Professor Katagiri to speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll open up for question and answer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Davis, uh, for the kind introduction, and then thank you, Shin, and thank you, Jennifer, for the uh, uh, for for your help setting this up. Very happy to be here uh, to talk about Japan's cybersecurity environment uh, with focus on external event, external uh, threats, and internal constraints on the use of uh, uh, force. Yeah, good. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, the topic of cybersecurity in Japan is pretty uh, complicated. Uh, it's actually so complicated that I thought about asking ChatGPT uh, to make the presentation for me uh, to make it a lot easier for me. I, and, I, and I was kind of serious about it, but decided not to do so because uh, we're going to talk about some human elements to it, uh, not just our AI, artificial, uh, and digital elements to what happens in cyberspace. So I'm going to talk about strategy that Japan adopts to defend its networks. 
I'm going to talk about some uh, numbers on reports made uh, in Japan uh, and an instance that occurred uh, in Japan, and especially instances that are contained and are not contained by, uh, by uh, uh, network pro providers. Uh, and I'm going to talk about four uh, issues that I think are important and warrant our attention within 30 minutes uh, before I finish uh, my conversation uh, with focus on some policy proposals and issues uh, that are out there. So starting with the strategy, uh, certainly uh, if you ask uh, chat GPT, I think uh, it can actually lay out a few principles that constitute Japan's cybersecurity strategy. And actually it does so better than uh, this, uh, this slide shows because it's more comprehensive based upon uh, trained data that it uses in order to collect the information uh, on the internet. Uh, so I'm gonna be selective, uh, focus on something uh, really important, which is basically Japan seeks to use cyberspace, uh, basically uh, seeks to ensure cyberspace uh, to be safe, uh, free, fair, and secure. Uh, 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 Japan's cybersecurity strategy uh, consists of five components, uh, broadly speaking, uh, and uh, they are the free flow of information, uh, rule of law, uh, openness, basically openness of the digital space in order to promote business and Japanese economic growth, uh, autonomy uh, in the sense of complying with the principle of sovereignty, uh, and collaboration uh, with a number of stakeholders, including uh, non-governmental organizations, the private sector, big firms, uh, small firms, uh, interest groups, uh, 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 as well as uh, allies and partners. But at the same time, if you actually search for a specific strategy that Japan adopts in defending networks, uh, you can't find anything. Uh, there is no single term uh, that really expresses what is a Japan strategy. So actually, you got you got to look into some details, you know, to come up with an idea or doctrine that I think is actually running the Japanese government to defend its networks, which is based upon the doctrine of defensive defense uh, or censured boy uh, gainen, right? Uh, the idea is basically uh, is that you know Japan is not going to use force until or cyber force until uh, attacked first. Uh, and uh, Japan would uh, maintain a minimum amount of force in order to defend its networks. And Japan would use minimum amount of force in order to, uh, in order to use, in order to defend networks when necessary too. But at the same time, uh, back in 2018, the Japanese government uh, published this uh, national defense program guideline uh, in which it suggested that it would seek the capability uh, to uh, conduct uh, self-defense operations in response to a major catastrophic cyber attack. Uh, so therefore we have this language, cross-domain operations or multi-domain operations basically the conduct of operations, not just in cyber domain, but also military domains. And actually, if you actually uh, look into the literature on cross-domain operations, uh, you can just see uh, not just the military and a, uh, military and a cyber operations, but also legal, uh, space, electronic, ma electromagnetics, uh, and so on, uh, in reflection of the complexity uh, of uh, international security landscape. And uh, this one, this sense boy concept is obviously uh, quite different from what we see overseas, uh, including Britain's uh, defense, uh, cyber security doctrine especially uh, the offensive cyber doctrine uh, published by the published last week uh, by the National Secu Na National Cyber Force. Uh, and also th this is different from uh, the American uh, doctrine of cyber security policy, uh, such as hunt forward uh, or defend forward or uh, persistent engagement uh, approaches that you know, we say that they are meant to be purely defensive, but uh, the United States government has conducted what amounts to offensive cyber operations against foreign targets, including uh, ISIS networks. And budget-wise, uh, uh, budget the Japanese government has uh, spent uh, roughly 700 million uh, US dollars two years ago, and the number has been rising. And uh, this is where uh, how the uh, the Japanese government allocates its defense on cybersecurity, 
the largest percentage goes to the Ministry of Defense. Uh, uh, they followed by uh, the Ministry, some of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, uh, and then by the next, the Ministry of Education, uh, and then the Digital Agency, which is a new, a relatively new government agency, is created in 2021. Uh, and in case that shows, so MPA, National Police Agencies, uh, METI, uh, and so on. So uh, uh, this is kind of uh, uh, the way the government uh, sees uh, the relative weight of importance with regard to uh, spending money. Uh, and uh, this reflects uh, the growing awareness by the government uh, uh, bureaucrats and private sector about the importance of spending more money and resources in defending its networks. However, what's really important is what the money buys uh, in terms of the capability that Japan gets uh, and uh, how Japan can use the capability to actually defend the networks and what it does in cyberspace uh, to do so. And I want to talk a little bit about how outsiders may see Japan's networks. Uh, uh, if you look at well, the publication by uh, a Harvard team, uh, last year, uh, in the document, uh, the National Cyber Power Index, uh, Japan was ranked uh, number 16 uh, last year, which is a little bit lower than number nine uh, three years ago. And uh, the index basically collect, uh, collected and analyzed the collection of uh, indices uh, in terms of the norms of compliance with the international law, uh, the capability to basically uh, shape the strategic narrative uh, about what countries can do and should do uh, in cyberspace, as well as uh, you know what kind of resources uh, countries spend uh, in order to defend the networks and so on. So the ranking uh, is uh, is uh, going down a little bit, but of course, if you look at uh, the relative uh, capability of Japan uh, to other countries, maybe number sixteen is not really bad. Uh, situation. But at the same time, I think I want to point out something that we don't really talk much about this in terms of the language barrier that actually protects Japanese networks a lot. And that's because, uh, you know, uh, if you're foreigners, non-Japanese speakers trying to really hack into Japanese networks, you're going to be relatively at least fluent or at least look fluent uh, in, in the messages that you send in phishing emails. And that requires a pretty high level of uh, uh, proficiency in Japanese language, although that barrier may be lowered by the introduction of AI, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. But I think uh, that's also uh, the case so far. Uh, at the same time, uh, Japan's economy, well, you know, arguably may still be based upon the cash economy uh, with a certain degree of uh, residual uh, resistance to the use of credit cards in, in, in financial transactions, uh, although this one uh, is obviously changing uh, drastically in Japanese economy in the last few years or so. So overall, and if you talk to uh, cybersecurity experts, and uh, they tend to say that Japan, you know, Japan has so many lucrative targets, especially uh, with the larger uh, and the large corporations, uh, 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 uninsured corporations. Uh, as well as small and medium-sized corporations, uh, 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 they are uh, uh, they remain really vulnerable, uh, and that's a kind of a uh, strategic environment that uh, that we got to deal with. And then certainly, if you look at the statistics of the last uh, three four years or so, uh, Japan is getting uh, more instance uh, instant reports. Uh, uh, in the last four years, according to this data provided by the JP CERT, and then JP CERT stands for uh, Japan Computer Emergency Response Team. Uh, and so uh, you see both, uh, excuse me, you see the rise uh, in the number of uh, reports made by Japanese uh, public, uh, and instances that actually occurred, uh, and the number of uh, instances that have been contained. Uh, what you want to see actually here is the gap between the two. It's one thing uh, for us to know how many instances that occurred in the past uh, 10 years or so, but it's also actually alarming 
uh, that only pretty much half of those instances have been contained from spreading to other networks, other, other victims and systems. Uh, so uh, a major task moving forward is to actually try to really shrink the gap between the number of instances and the number that have not been contained in the past few years. But at the same time, it's important for us to point out uh, potential uh, reasons uh, for the increase in the number of cyber attacks, broadly speaking. Uh, they may include things like the increase uh, in attacks, attack surface, uh, that is, uh, attack surface increase is basically uh, driven by the greater use of uh, mobile technologies, uh, cell phones and computers among the Japanese public. Uh, you may also see an increase in attack frequencies by cyber attackers, hackers, uh, and in their operational repertoires, including the introduction of new methods and tactics such as uh, 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 ransomware attacks and so on. And are more sophisticated uh, technologies that they bring in uh, in order to uh, uh, enable their operations, such as use of cryptocurrencies, as opposed to traditional web-based uh, payment systems. Um, attackers may have also realized uh, the degree uh, of Japanese vulnerability, and then that may also explain uh, the increase in cyber attacks on Japanese networks. Uh, COVID may be another reason, or the Olympics and the Paralympics uh, back in 2021 may be responsible probably for it. Uh, and also, I would say uh, there, is an there has been an improvement in detection capability uh, by Japanese defenders and system administrators and forensic scientists, as well as the fact that the incidents tend to be reported a little bit belatedly. Uh, this is where we have this concept of dwell time. Dwell time is the basically the, the average time uh, between uh, a, a cyber attack and a detection. And it used to be really long. It used to be uh, on the average, depending on what regions of the world that you look at, uh, it used to be really long. And then sometimes you see more than a year uh, on average for a company to know that they have been hacked or uh, and so on. But now it, got, uh, it has shrunk, uh, shrunk to uh, maybe three, three months, two months or something like that. Although if you are a defender, if you are a victim of cyber attacks, two months, three months is long enough, actually too long for them to protect their secrets. So there remain just so many, uh, so many uh, challenges in detection, uh, prevention, and of course, attribution of cyber, uh, capability, cyber attacks. Uh, and I'm going to uh, focus on uh, four uh, types of threats that I think are important uh, moving forward when we, when we think about cyber security, cyber defense. Obviously, the four are not uh, exhaustive. Uh, there's just so many other challenges that we have to talk about, but I want to raise them because uh, not many people have done so in the Japanese context. Uh, and I thought, and I also wanted to get your thoughts about what I think about these. Uh, uh, about these uh, these threats. So starting with the first uh, vulnerability uh, is the possibility of a preemptive cyber attack, uh, and especially catastrophic impact uh, on Japanese networks uh, in order to decapacitate uh, the government ability uh, to protect the networks and actually carry out what we call cyber countermeasures. Uh, countermeasure, when I, when I say countermeasures, uh, they can be passive defense countermeasures, uh, such as the use of security control, uh, safeguards, uh, rapid reaction, uh, and uh, even public education about the importance and the need for uh, cyber defense. Uh, but at the same time, uh, countermeasures can include active defense countermeasures, uh, such as the use of let's say retaliation by hacking back. Uh, you could also deploy what we call honey pots. Basically they are fake, uh, uh, fake programs uh, designed to lure hackers into networks in order to steal attackers' uh, secrets, their capability and the intent and so on, and let them actually get into your uh, networks so that you can actually learn about their capability and, and, and intent. Uh, there are several programs of that kind. 
Uh, but uh, we have no uh, known instance uh, in which the Japanese government has used these kind of uh, kind of measure capabilities. And so this basically is the concept of a cyber pong harbor uh, that uh, a few uh, digital experts have been talking about. But the reality uh, is that that really hasn't happened uh, so far, uh, despite uh, the Estonian incident back in 2007 uh, and a few other uh, ransomware operations uh, on the global stage. Uh, but uh, there have been many cases that we could have seen of Cyber Palm Harbor, but didn't happen in places like Ukraine last year uh, during COVID, Olympics and Paralympics two years ago, as well as the 2020 uh, American presidential election really didn't happen. And that's because this catastrophic preemptive strike uh, is more likely to happen uh, in wartime or right before a war uh, begins. Uh, as opposed to peacetime. So the idea is that as long as Japan maintains peaceful relations with its neighbors, such as Japan, uh, such as China uh, and North Korea, uh, this is not going to happen. Uh, but at the same time, it's important for us to point out uh, that there are uh, uh, challenges with regard to existing the legal uh, uh, mechanism in Japan, as well as the normative constraints on the use of force in general. Uh, that make it difficult for Japan to maintain its capability and actually carry out operations in order to deter uh, attackers. So that's the first threat that I wanted to talk about. And the second one uh, is basically digital spying. Uh, spying not on uh, ordinary Japanese people, uh, uh, like many of us, but uh, uh, people with uh, uh, political and a strategic, strategic value. Uh, especially uh, lawmakers, uh, ministers of uh, uh, digital security, uh, bureaucrats, uh, major firms that have a lot of secrets, uh, trade secrets, uh, cyber secret, digital secrets, and so on, uh, who can be subject to the use of many uh, spyware programs that uh, Dr. Davis was talking about, uh, that both foreign and domestic agents uh, could use. And so I'm talking about programs, spyware programs like Pegasus uh, and, uh, and Predator, uh, uh, whose instance have been known on an increasing level, uh, have been affected by many individuals and politicians across Europe. Wouldn't be surprising uh, if something like that happens uh, among Japanese uh, politicians, especially not so much among bureaucrats, uh, but politicians especially. Uh, who may lack uh, some fundamental knowledge about the fundamental uh, awareness of the uh, of the threat environment, especially those programs that can deploy uh, what we call uh, zero click uh, uh, exploits, basically programs that you don't have to click on anything like phishing emails or uh, malicious uh, files uh, in order to get infected with virus. And that's because by the time you know it, uh, or it has it happened without you clicking on anything. Uh, so those programs are especially malicious, but uh, has happened. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, related to, uh, and this may stem from the chronic shortage uh, of, uh, of social awareness and the diff technical difficulty of actually defending uh, and preventing uh, these, uh, these attacks. Uh, another uh, point that I want to make uh, here is this, uh, this, uh, this absence of legal ban uh, on the use of spyware programs. And that's a really keen issue uh, when it comes to the, the legal dimension of cyberspace in Japan, as long as uh, there is a lack of flexibility in interpreting Japanese law to defend uh, uh, networks from these programs, especially uh, as uh, uh, there have been strong uh, 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 inclinations uh, to use this positive uh, list interpretation of Japanese law, uh, meaning that uh, the government uh, can actually conduct uh, operations only if uh, there is a written law for it. Right? Uh, as long as we have that kind of interpretation of law, uh, really makes it difficult for uh, for them to defend the networks without coming up with, uh, coming up with that. Uh, new new legal measure. 
another question here is uh, the questions about uh, the, the, the coverage of cyber insurance. Uh, there has been an increasing number of uh, companies, both small and large in Japan that have actually sought after and actually gained uh, cybersecurity uh, instant coverages. Uh, but there still remains uh, 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 questions about uh, coverage use on uh, uh, spyware programs, uh, as well as uh, uh, ransomware attacks, um, DDoS, uh, uh, the distributed denial of service, uh, phishing emails, and so on. Are they in the contract? Are they in the terms of negotiations with, uh, uh, with cybersecurity instance? Uh, there are many questions about that. And even if those terms uh, may be written uh, in their contracts and premiums, uh, insurance companies could, uh, uh, could trigger the so-called war clause uh, in order to deny coverage uh, to victims. So that's another uh, problems uh, that we have to be aware of as well. And the third threat that I want to talk about uh, is the threat to uh, subsea uh, uh, communication uh, cables. Uh, I'm going to just be really uh, broad on this uh, on this page. That there, across the globe, there are over 500 cables that really enable countries to communicate digitally uh, with each other, and that's all good. And they are privately owned and are shared by different companies and suppliers. Uh, there's a lot of competition between American and, and Chinese com uh, companies, as you can see uh, recently in New York Times reports. Um, in Japan's case, uh, many of the cables uh, are supplied uh, by the American company called uh, Subcom, uh, which is a New Jersey based, uh, New Jersey -based uh, communications uh, company. Uh, but you know this one is really critical, and it doesn't really uh, get much of our attention. Uh, uh, although uh, those cables actually carry a lot of private data, uh, including internet calls, uh, phone calls, uh, uh, social media uh, information, and so on. Uh, and the system is actually pretty complex, uh, with a number of uh, vulnerable points, uh, including uh, landing points, as you can see in the in the picture. Uh, beach manholes, uh, points of presence that actually interact uh, and, and communicates with the rest of our Japanese, uh, rest, of, uh, rest of the networks in, in the Japanese archipelago, as well as uh, uh, physical threats to shorelines and uh, physical threats to cables. And that's because there's just so many threats that we, gotta, uh, we can be aware of, uh, including both physical threats uh, and digital threats. Physical threats may come from the possibility that those cables may be cut uh, by enemy intent. Uh, thieves uh, who may be looking for valuable materials in those cables, especially copper. Um, accidents is actually the, the largest number of uh, uh, physical threats uh, to those cables come from uh, accidents in terms of fishing uh, and anchoring of, uh, of ships. Uh, but also weather, uh, earthquakes, and so on. So they are vulnerable physically, but also uh, cyber attacks uh, pose uh, other challenges uh, to landing facilities, uh, exchange ports, uh, uh, command, and, uh, command and control capability, uh, and uh, supply chain attacks, meaning that uh, if uh, a part of the whole system is attacked by a cyber attack and, uh, and uh, compromised, uh, uh, that may actually allow uh, hackers to, uh, to move into other networks. Uh, uh, that's what we mean by basically by supply attacks, supply, uh, supply chain cyber attacks. So there are many types of uh, threats uh, that we have to be aware of. And the last uh, uh, vulnerability that I want to raise for this presentation uh, is, uh, is information warfare uh, in Japan on steroid. Uh, meaning that uh, well, there's nothing new uh, uh, about the fact that there has been uh, uh, an increase uh, both in the degree uh, and, and the number of disinformation campaigns in the past. Uh, there is nothing new because we have seen them uh, occur uh, in many advanced democracies, including the United States. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we got to be uh, aware of this, uh, the potential intensification of this uh, uh, information warfare, 
uh, with the introduction uh, of uh, advanced technologies uh, with uh, artificial intelligence capabilities, uh, with the introduction of the variety uh, of uh, cryptocurrencies that are used in cyber attacks, uh, that's where they can facilitate the process of the negotiations with victims. They can facilitate with the process of uh, money, one, uh, money laundering and so many law enforcement problems that are out there. But at the same time, the recent uh, experiences that we have had with the uh, top level, uh, most sophisticated versions of AI products uh, basically uh, indicates that uh, you know malicious actors can do all kinds of bad things to listen to to make their voices uh, trust uh, that sound really realistic uh, for people in financial distress. Uh, you can create all kinds of uh, you know really uh, uh, all kinds of uh, images, both positive but especially negative images of politicians. Uh, in order to uh, steer voters uh, and affect the, the way they think about, uh, especially at critical times, such as election times and national security crisis. Uh, so there is just so much uh, potentiality uh, in this respect that uh, as we understand uh, the complexity of new technologies being introduced to cyberspace, that make, basically that allows uh, malicious actors to take advantage of the existing vulnerabilities uh, to make those problems even deeper. So this is the final slide that I have. <clears throat> and the uh, I'm going to just talk about a few ideas uh, that are out there uh, uh, to, uh, uh, that people have talked about uh, in order to uh, make uh, Japanese networks and defense more robust than before. And obviously, uh, we have been talking a lot uh, about the need uh, to spend more resources, uh, to increase the number of trained personnel uh, to be able to deal with uh, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, 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 the need to increase uh, cybersecurity uh, budget, uh, improve work conditions of people who actually do so, because it's 24 seven job and we need more people and the government uh, uh, agencies uh, whether you are in the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of, Ministry of Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs, MIC, METI, uh, and so on, uh, uh, they are basically competing uh, to maintain their workforce uh, uh, against uh, the private sector, especially because the salary is higher in the latter. There has been a lot of conversations about the need to strengthen collaboration between the public and the private sector, increase social awareness of uh, the threat environment uh, through public education, uh, for public support uh, for what the government does, and so on. Um, uh, system upgrades, especially because there remains uh, some tendencies for small companies not to spend so much on system upgrades that can be expensive. Uh, and then they, their tendency is to, uh, to wait as late as possible until they get hit uh, to upgrade their systems. Uh, insurance issues, you can also talk about more protection of critical infrastructure, uh, such as uh, the medical systems, the train systems in Japan, uh, airplanes, uh, nuclear facilities, self-defense forces facilities, uh, electricity, water, uh, and so on. There's, you know, many uh, industries that need to be protected with higher priority. Um, so those are uh, already out there, but at the same time, I want to raise a couple of points here. Uh, one is this, the need, perhaps the need for the centralization of responsibility as the, the uh, as the defense of a variety of uh, uh, private sector companies. Uh, and government agencies has been decentralized. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, that may require uh, more centralization and a, with a stronger oversight uh, on networks. Uh, there is also a possible conversation about more flex flexibility uh, 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 on the uh, interpretation of the existing law uh, in order to enable uh, law enforcement uh, activity uh, and the conduct uh, of cross domain operations to actually allow uh, more self defense forces operations in response to a cyber attack, especially those cyber attacks on government uh, facilities. 
Uh, so those are the issues that are out there uh, that may require more conversations uh, from us. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent presentation, very clear and perfectly on time and uh, fascinating ideas for both how government should be organized and the strategies that to be reviewed. We have a question first from Kei Kitanohara, who is a fellow with the program on US-Japan relations coming from the National Police Agency. And this year, while at Harvard, Kitanohara-san is doing research on a legal framework for cyber crime investigation in the United States. Thank you. Thank you for Professor uh, Katagi Sensei, and uh, thank you for your great presentation from the really comprehensive perspective. And uh, I think the Japanese government should consider your recommendations seriously. Um, uh, as a member of the Japanese government and uh, with some experience in cybersecurity domain, so I feel we have to make a lot of effort to improve the cybersecurity of our society. So, and then from my perspective, the United States seems to view so-called cybersecurity in the uh, national security context, non-military to military as a continu continuous, uh, uh, continuous uh, <clears throat> concept. So, and on the other hand, the Japanese government seems to start viewing the non-military cybersecurity to military cyber operations, including gray zone situations as a combined things. So this understanding, I think the public-private cooperation is crucial. Um, and the government of Japan should work on enhancing private and public co collaboration. So do you think how the Japanese government should act? Um, and then also, I understand that Japanese government used in the national security related documents in the is starting to use the active cyber defense in their documents. So, but uh, there is no definition in that document. So I'm curious about what do you think is the meaning of the active cyber defense and uh, its value in the context of the national security? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Those are very good questions. And especially I really appreciate those coming from uh, someone who is probably involved in the actual policy process, I would imagine. So it's really good. Uh, so I got two questions. One is about the collaboration between the public sector and the private sector. Uh, and the other question is, is about uh, addresses the, uh, the active defense, uh, excuse me, active cyber defense. Uh, so uh, with regard to the first uh, question on the collaboration, uh, I would actually expect more uh, collaboration, not just between uh, public and in private uh, within Japan, but also private and in private outside Japan, especially as the Japanese government uh, and uh, uh, Japanese NPOs like the JP CERT uh, continue to rely on programs provided by, uh, let's say, American or Western uh, technology and then, uh, consultation firms bypassing Japanese security companies. So of course, there are elements of collaboration between the Japanese and then, uh, Japanese private sector and then foreign private sectors too. But I think that's where you want to uh, spend more uh, talent, talent and resources in making uh, the indigenous capability uh, so as to make them more competitive uh, on par with uh, foreign technology companies to work with the Japanese government. Uh, that's where I see uh, more opportunities. It's not just a, a matter of uh, Japanese government competing against Japanese private sector over talent. Uh, and so on. Uh, of course, that's that's been uh, that's been acknowledged for some time, but I think uh, it's it's more. And of course, you got to pay. You're going to make more competitive pay, uh, work conditions for uh, for uh, for those private sectors in order to uh, let them into the Japanese, let them into the government of, of government work. But also, I think there needs to be more uh, more efforts to uh, to strengthen the, uh, the private sector. Capabilities. Uh, with regard to the second question about active cyber defense, I really appreciate it. That's where I personally, and this is recorded. <laughs> um, I have a few things to say off the record, but uh, 
We'll have a private lunch later. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that, that's helpful. Uh, sorry about that, everybody on, on online. But uh, you know, basically, you know, uh, there are there are many uh, many ways to define uh, active cyber defense. Uh, what is you know active you know active you know, what does it mean to be active in cyberspace without being passive or with being passive in cyberspace? Uh, there are a lot of overlap uh, with the use of terms like active defense, uh, excuse me, active cyber defense and cyber deterrence for the use of cyber countermeasures and so on. And I tend to associate with the I tend to associate uh, the language of active cyber defense with an effort to uh, to deter, uh, meaning that uh, you know the uh, having the ability uh, and uh, the willingness to use force in order to impose uh, a, a lot of pain on hackers and then cyber attacks in order to deter a uh, future attack. Uh, I think uh, that's a kind of the direction that the Japanese government document, many of the Japanese government's uh, documents may suggest, uh, including uh, uh, you know, the, the National Defense Program guideline of five years ago, uh, with regard to multi-domain operations, uh, cross-domain operations, and so on. Uh, but uh, if I can be critical about uh, uh, what we see and what we read, I think there's a gap uh, between what the government says and it does. Uh, well, you know, it's one thing for us, to, you know, for them to search for capability and actually gain the capability to carry out uh, active cyber defense, but it's another to actually do so. Uh, five years into the you know, after the document was published, uh, we don't really see uh, any uh, concrete uh, uh, evidence uh, for it. So that's where I, I tend to be uh, a little bit skeptical about what the government is actually willing to do. Do you have questions in the room? Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm just sort of curious. I, I know I don't want to make you reveal too much on the record here, but just what, what are the kinds of threats that Japan faces in the next five, 10 years, uh, you know, maybe from terrorist groups, from Korea, China, Russia? Yeah, the, the greatest I would imagine, so those are the four I think are serious uh, serious uh, sources of threats to uh, to Japanese networks. But actually, the, the greatest one is the AI-powered uh, disinformation campaigns that can actually manipulate public images on TV, on, on, on cell phones. Uh, 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 and, and, and actually uh, mislead uh, uh, the, the, the minds of Japanese public and actually affect um, and reshape the discourse uh, on issues that are already controversial. And there are many uh, controversial issues in Japanese society today, um, you know, including uh, the treatment uh, of the, uh, let's say, the Unification Church, uh, the treatment of the uh, LGBTQ uh, community, uh, the treatment of uh, uh, immigrants, uh, foreigners, uh, labor force, uh, as well as uh, potentially uh, controversial uh, issues like the uh, the role of a uh, Nisegin or Seshu, uh, you know, the politicians, uh, you know, those are issues that can be really uh, manipulated uh, election times by uh, external tampering, uh, tampering uh, of existing uh, uh, artificial intelligence capabilities. Uh, so those are uh, and those are stories of in the realm of uh, hypothesis at this point, uh, rather than a reality. Uh, but I think that's the direction that we are uh, being led into. Uh, that requires a lot of attention, but it's really hard for us to uh, to come up with a specific image of what will happen uh, at, at critical times in Japan. But that that basically requires us uh, to pay constant attention, uh, constantly monitoring uh, the public space, uh, uh, as well as dark web you know, places like that that can actually do lots of bad things, but uh, to Japanese consumers uh, and voters about their financial transactions. Stuff like that, I would, I would pay a lot of attention. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Shinek Moriyama. I'm a, a associate of the US Japan program. I'm from the Ministry of Finance, and we, our ministry has a tax, tax office. 
and uh, tax information is very important. Therefore, in order to protect our information, our network is separate from the outside network. But it's very inconvenient. The network is useful because it's open to the public. Therefore, uh, my question is, is it a good way to protect from the cyber attack? And second question is, I'm not uh, no, uh, understand about the cyber, cyber attack. How do they attack cyber? So usually I need an ID and password to, to access something. They know or they get somehow these code to access it's a cyber attack. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the good question. I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, with regard to passwords, I think Dr. Davis mentioned a little bit, you know, the importance of us constantly changing you know, passwords every 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 few weeks and so on, uh, and, and using uh, double authentication uh, uh, before you sign in uh, into secure networks, especially including internet systems that you, that you mentioned. Um, you know, malicious actors like hackers can do all kinds of stuff uh, in order to get into networks. You know, with just, just using the example of passwords, you can brute force uh, passwords, basically, you know, using number, using a, a variety of algorithms uh, in AI programs uh, to generate a number of possibilities you know, to correctly guess your password, uh, and that's really uh, that's really uh, uh, critical. You, uh, your systems can be uh, subject to uh, external tampering and an entry uh, through supply chain attacks. Uh, so, uh, if you have uh, some kind of connections uh, uh, to uh, to your uh, associate units or outside units. Uh, and if the unit uh, gets compromised by a cyber attack, uh, that could uh, allow the, uh, uh, the the hacker uh, to get into your network. I think that uh, I think something similar happened to the network of the Japan uh, Defense Academy uh, a few years ago when uh, the Ground Forces uh, website, uh, Ground Forces network, was attacked uh, because of its connected networks to. Uh, to to different units, uh, so things like that can happen, uh, and also uh, uh, hacking in a sense may result from uh, uh, obviously you know clicking on, on malicious emails and files that really shouldn't open, uh, and you know we keep saying those things uh, over the years, but uh, if if you are a hacker and then just sent uh, you know one hundred uh, phishing emails to all kinds of people, usually one or two people will click on it and open it. That can allow, again, hackers to go into different uh, networks and systems. So uh, so the education uh, about the vulnerability and, uh, uh, and threat environment has to be really comprehensive and complete across, uh, across, across any countries. Thank you. And so when you say centralization, you mean that's the government management. Yes. But in terms of this question of networks, it could make sense to have multiple networks to minimize yes. risk. Yes, in order to uh, in order to separate and contain the spread proliferation of a single cyber attack, uh, one way to do it is to separate, definitely. Uh, and a vulnerability emerges, uh, a vulnerability may emerge when you actually reconnect the networks without actually paying much attention to it. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, we have a couple of questions online and then I'll come back to the room. Jeffrey Allen asks, Japan recently announced significant increases in defense spending. Can you confirm whether any additional sources of funding have been earmarked for cyber defense specifically? I don't know, uh, to be frank with you. I gotta, uh, I think, uh, it won't be too difficult to look uh, to look into the document and actually look for the numbers. Mm -hmm. I would imagine the number is actually rising. 
uh, was looking at the proposal by the Japanese Ministry of Defense uh, and, of course, the budget uh, that, they, uh, that they desire for cyber defense is increasing. Uh, but at the same time, it has to be relative to other components of defense requests that they are making, especially with the, uh, with the with their search for the capability to step, you know, uh, to conduct standoff operations uh, using longer range missiles in order to defend uh, uh, against uh, preempt preemptive strikes in places like China and North Korea. Uh, so my understanding is that the budget allocation is increasing. Uh, uh, compared to the past, but uh, we got to look at the uh, how it uh, uh, relates to the rest of our purchase uh, requirements uh, that it has. Great. Well, thank you so very much. It's been fascinating to hear from you, and I'm glad to hear that you're engaging with these policy issues and that the Japanese government and the norm development is pushing forward. A lot of defensive defense requires understanding what counts as an attack and what are appropriate responses. And so that area of foreign policy is really valuable. Hopefully some of your policy recommendations will filter in through the government to our audience and your publications. So thank you so much for your thank work you. and joining us today. All right, thank you so much.